All right. Isn't that disgusting? All right. Hopefully you enjoyed that. So all of you now have the uh, the assignment to go find uh, uh, images or, or video of the most disturbing and disgusting uh, pollution you can around the Great Lakes. That one was mine. <laughs> right. Uh, let's move on to some more pollutants. Metals are, are you know, heavy metals can be, uh, you know, an industrial pollutant as well. Um, they often come from manufacturing, mining, mineral processing, right? Um, but, uh, you know, so in the chemical industry, glass industry, fertilizers have arsenic in them. Why do fertilizers need arsenic? I don't know, but they got it in there anyway, right? So, um, you know, these are also, you know, leaking into our system. Arsenic's in a lot of these. Wow, holy cow. That doesn't seem good, right? Arsenic's a deadly poison, beryllium. Okay. Anyway, so none of these are really good. Uh, you don't really want to drink these, right? You don't want them in your system, right? Uh, we'll focus, though, on, on mercury. I know we talked a little bit about this uh, when we talked mining as well, uh, but it is one of the most prevalent uh, um, uh, pollutants out there uh, because we use it so much in mining up to the 1970s, right? Mercury, again, has an affinity for gold. You mix it, uh, mercury, uh, and here's what's called quicksilver. This is the liquid mercury. You'd throw that, you know, mercury in for in with the gold and stir it around, and it'll clump the gold together for you, and then you get the gold out and dump the mercury into the lake, right? So the problem is, once it's in the lake or the water, microbes take up this mercury and turn it into a methyl mercury. Uh, so taken up by algae. Uh, methyl mercury is a extremely potent neurotoxin, right? This neurotoxin is eaten by algae. The uh, algae is consumed by smaller fish, right? Uh, those smaller fish are consumed by larger fish. Those larger fish are consumed by eventually us, right? And each time we go up these steps, we increase the concentration of mercury, right? So whatever, you know, however much algae, however much mercury is in there, right, goes into the, this fish, right? Uh, however many of these fish this guy eats, the mercury in them goes into him, right? However many of these fish you eat, that mercury goes into you, right? And by the time you get to this level here, the large predatory fish, there's can there are, uh, levels of mercury can be, can be uh, millions or tens of millions of times higher than the water that they live in, right? So you're getting very high doses of mercury when you eat these fish. That's why pregnant women aren't supposed to eat wild caught salmon, right? And this is the idea of biomagnification, right? As you concentrate up the food chain, so from algae to small to larger to us, right? You concentrate that, that uh, mercury level as you move up the food chain, right? And again, methylmercury, extremely potent neurotoxin and has a long half-life in the body, right? So before we talked about uh, resonance time, resonance time is how long a pollutant or a toxin stays in the environment before it breaks down, right? How long it lives in the water or the groundwater, or, you know, whatever, right? Um, half-life is how long that, that pollutant or toxin lives in your body before it breaks down, right? So having a half-life, this means basically how long does it take till half the amount you originally consumed is gone, right? So methylmercury has an extremely long half-life. So this long half-life helps it build up in your body, right? And then there's toxic waste. Toxic waste being, you know, things that are hazardous to living organisms, right? Being, you know, whether you want them to die or not, right? So just, this is just toxic waste, right? Uh, they can be synthetic, organic, inorganic kind of, you know, uh, chemicals and products, right? Um, but uh, these uh, often are, you know, especially the, the, the synthetic and inorganic ones, they don't break down very fast in the system. In other words, they have a long residence time and they also tend to have a long half-life in your body, right? So long residence time in the environment, long half-life in your body, right? Um, when these toxins and pollutants, uh, you know, get into surface or subsurface waters, this can cause a very big issue, right? So here's some toxic pollutants that are, you know, just been dumped in these barrels in a landfill, right? I mean, you can even see they're steaming. I don't know if that's supposed to be toxicity coming off of them or what, but uh, but there they are, right? And we'll, we'll look back at this in just a minute. Um, We'll, uh, we'll look at toxic waste and uh, Rockford here where I live, right? 
well, let's talk about a couple of new and emerging threats and one that I didn't really think of. So I started kind of teaching this class and a few others on, on Great Lakes water. Um, microplastics or just plastics alone, right? So microplastics are plastics that are less than two millimeters in diameter, right? They can be um, little bits of fibers off of uh, off of uh, fleece. Fleece actually sheds like 150,000 fibers every time you wash it, uh, um, microfibers. Uh, they can be what, what are called nurdles, which are my favorite thing, which are little colored brown beads that of plastic that people use to create colored plastics, right? Or they can be just stuff that's been broken down, but uh, these plastics are, are bad, right? So micro beads or microplastics, uh, or microplastics are anything smaller than two millimeters. Micro beads are small little um, beads of plastic that used to be in, in uh, um, um, personal products like uh, face wash for exfoliation and and uh, even like abrasive in, in toothpaste, right? They're now banned uh, because they're going everywhere, right? And in the Great Lakes alone, Right. I mean, we know plastic pollution is an, an issue in the oceans. Right. We got the, the Pacific garbage patch and the Atlantic garbage patch. Right. Um, well, the Great Lakes themselves, each year we dump 22 million pounds, 22 million pounds of plastic into the Great Lakes each year. Right. And the Great Lakes have six quadrillion gallons of water. So, I mean, there's a lot of water, but, you know, um, over half of that. Uh, are microplastics, right? So 11 million pounds a year of microscopic little tiny plastics, right? Not necessarily microscopic, but tiny plastics, right? And fish then consume these. We, this is so new, we really don't have a lot of um, uh, uh, insight yet on what, what potential harms there could be, right? We're still learning. Scientists are investigating a surprising new pollutant in the country's waterways, those tiny plastic beads found in common cosmetic products. The state of Illinois is the first to ban what they call microbeads. Brandis Friedman of WTTW Chicago reports. What if you could shrink your pores just by washing your face? Microbeads have been all the rage in hand sanitizers, body wash, and facial scrub, even toothpaste. They're supposed to help remove dead cells or tighten pores as the product in this commercial claims. But they worry Olga Leandris. If you think about how many of these are being used daily and washed down the drain, um, it's, it's quite staggering. Leandris is the research manager for the Alliance for the Great Lakes. This is something that impacts the ecosystem, the wildlife, by entangling fish and, and uh, birds ingest these particles and it impacts their health. But also it's a sort of a, a cultural, you know, issue because people who grew up, grew up around the Great Lakes and go to the beach don't want to go to a beach that's dirty and littered by plastic items. Scientists are also seeing evidence that the microbeads are reaching the water. At Loyola University Chicago, Professor Timothy Holine and his student researchers are looking for the plastic beads in samples of water taken from rivers in and around Chicago as well as Lake Michigan. Last year, Sherry Mason at the State University of New York in Fredonia found anywhere from 1,500 to 1.1 million microbeads per square mile in the Great Lakes, the world's largest source of fresh water. What we're interested in doing is uh, determining the concentration of microplastic that's in the rivers, determining the source of microplastic, and also the different types of these small plastic pieces that we find in the river. So far, Holine says his research shows that the synthetic microbeads are coming from treated wastewater that flows into sanitary canals and rivers, which feed into larger bodies of water. Our initial findings from the North Shore Channel showed um, very high concentrations of microplastic downstream of a wastewater effluent source. And in fact, our concentrations were higher than what had been found in the ocean. Uh, so not only did we find it, but we found a lot of the material. In June, Governor Pat Quinn signed into law legislation making Illinois the first state in the union to ban the manufacture and sale of personal care products containing synthetic plastic microbeads. The new law requires that the beads be removed from manufacturing by the end of 2018 and the products can no longer be sold starting at the end of 2019. And since major manufacturers make products for the entire country, other states will begin to notice the change on their store shelves as well. 
whether or not they passed their own ban. Leandris, whose organization was pushing for the ban in Illinois, wanted the products gone sooner. We would have liked to have seen a more compressed timeline for phase out. The sooner you can get these companies to make uh, products available with alternatives, the better and less of it ends up in the waterways. Two organizations representing the personal care product industry worked with the environmental advocates and lawmakers to craft the Illinois bill. Representatives from the Personal Care Products Council declined an on-camera interview, but in a statement said, quote, our industry takes concerns regarding the presence of plastic microbeads in the environment very seriously. Many personal care products companies have voluntarily committed to discontinue formulating with plastic microbeads in cleansing products in favor of other viable alternatives, despite the uncertainty associated with the science. It is true that the long-term impact of the microbeads on the environment is unknown, and scientists are looking into how they might carry other organisms and chemicals. One of the concerns is that the microbes on that plastic could be pathogenic. They might be disease-causing, and they may be kind of dispersed further in the environment on a plastic uh, uh, surface than they would on a natural surface. And because the beads float on the water's surface, fish mistake them for food. The plastic alone is bad for fish health, but so are the microbes that the beads can carry. Once the plastic is inside their guts, it can actually come off. So it may represent a, a kind of delivery mechanism for uh, these harmful chemicals that just didn't exist previously. Among other unanswered questions, do humans end up unknowingly eating the plastic after it's been consumed by fish? There really is no research on the long-term impact of microbeads or other forms of microplastic because uh, we've only just recently started looking for them. Microbeads end up in the waterways because water treatment plants simply can't catch them. They're too small. So small that even if there's a sand filter in a plant, it doesn't stop them from passing through the plant and into the water environment. This is the third step in the water treatment process, where water is aerated, so lighter material rises to the top and heavier weight sinks to the bottom. But somewhere in the mix are still the microbeads, which make it through this entire multi-step process and are sent out to the sanitary and ship canal along with fully treated water. Pretty much nothing that you all can do about that. Not without a significant investment. David St. Pierre is the executive director of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. He argues we should focus on prevention. If we were to adapt our plans to deal with microbeads, it would be a very expensive process. If we deal with it on the front end, we take care of it before it's a problem by eliminating it as a pollutant source, very inexpensive way to deal with the problem. Finding a new problem in our freshwater ecosystems is alarming and concerning, and we would all be worried. But I think what the Illinois ban on microbeads has shown is that once we become aware of the problem, and the scale and the context and the sources, uh, we can really start to take some real action towards some meaningful solutions. Legislatures in New York, California, and Ohio are considering bans similar to Illinois. Instead of plastics, some manufacturers are already planning to use natural ingredients like apricot seeds, sand, or oatmeal to achieve the same goals. Yeah, right. Oh, where are we going? Okay. All right. So microbeads, y'all, right? So, um, yeah, the, you know, personal care products and all that. But also, it can, you know, just come from the breakdown of larger things. Like I said, you know, washing machines can, can you know, put fleece and other plastics into the into the environment, right? Just the, the sun breaking it down into smaller chunks can make microplastics as well, right? But, uh, yeah, 11 million pounds a year of microplastics go into the Great Lakes, right? So... Let's talk now a bit about one of those toxins, those toxic chemicals. Uh, and this has to do with Wolverine Worldwide in Rockford, Michigan, where I live, right? In the 1960s and 1970s, this company uh, was making hush puppies. And hush puppies used pig leather, not, not, not cow leather. Pig leather is not necessarily waterproof. So they added the Scotch Guard as a protectant uh, on these hush puppies, right? And the Scotch Guard contains per and polyfluoroalkali compounds, right? Known also, lovingly, as PFAS, P-F-A-S, right? And you probably have heard about this PFAS contamination in Rockford, right? Um, has a several issues. Uh, it does bioaccumulate, so it has a long uh, half-life in the body. It has a long residence time in the ground, right? Or in, in, the, in the environment, right? And it is linked to 
things such as kidney cancer, testicular cancer, arterial colitis, pregnancy-induced hypertension, thyroid problems, cholesterol issues, just to name a few, right? And it's you know, been linked to several deaths here in Rockford now as well, right? Uh, PFOS does pose a significant health risk, right? So again, in the 60s and early 70s, they used a Scotch guard, right? But we didn't have any environmental regulations as far as Clean Air, Clean Water Act, right? Let's kind of dump it anywhere. And they did, they, they dumped this in, in large barrels, the excess stuff in state landfills, right? Here's what those barrels now look like, right? So here's those barrels full of toxic PFOS, right? Obviously the PFOS is no longer in the barrels, right? Where has it gone? Well, most of it has gone into the groundwater, right? So in 60s and 70s, they dumped chemicals in these barrels at, at several sites around Rockford. How many exactly is not quite known yet, uh, but they were dumping them legally, right? Chemicals then have since been obviously leaching into the groundwater, right? Therefore, they've also leached into the nearby streams like the Rogue River drainage basin, right? Uh, the Rogue River dumps into the Grand River, right? So they made it in the Grand River. The Grand River dumps into Lake Michigan, so they've also made it into Lake Michigan, right? And of course, the highest concentrations being right here in Rockford, right? So here's the issue, right? Now on House Street, this is where the, the stuff was originally kind of kind of located here. Um, the issue is EPA says the health advisory um, level, the safe level for drink for water uh, for PFAS is 70 parts per trillion, right? Part per trillion is very small. Most of the times we're looking at parts per million or parts per billion, parts per trillion so, I mean, really just, I mean, that's, that's, there's about five labs in the country that can test parts per billion. It'll cost you a couple thousand dollars per test. So even if you're living in this area and you're being a good doobie and, you know, you've got your well water and you're testing your well water every year, you would never have seen this because it's too small of a, uh, it won't show up on there, right? Now, Harvard says the actually safe level is one part per trillion instead of 70, right? Um, but the issue here. One of the wells on House Street, and many of these around here, but the kind of the hot spot, right, where those uh, those barrels were, those barrels, yeah. The house right by those barrels tested at 38,000 parts per trillion. That's 542 times the EPA's safe health advisory limit. Uh, it's also 38,000 times Harvard's safe, well, safe uh, limit, right? Um, and now they found, you know, all sorts of issues all around Rockford is now in litigation because not because they weren't legally dumping it. I mean, they were legally dumping it back in the 60s and 70s. The issue is back in the late 90s, um, uh, 3M, who makes Scotchgard, sent a letter to Wolverine Worldwide and says, hey, you have to do some remediation. This stuff is toxic. And Wolverine Worldwide essentially kicked that letter under the table and ignored it for 20 years. And then that meantime, several people died. So now they're in litigation. Okay. Here's a video about a lady who lives at ground zero. Things you should never mix with water. Mascara. Home electronics. Mm -hmm. Soda. Now I'm finding out that they've done a variety of tannery waste, sludge, chemicals, everything. So my property is now basically ground zero uh, with the highest rates of PFAS that the neighborhood has. <sighs> the first rate I think was 27,000 parts per trillion and my most recent rate was close to my understanding after reading is the EPA's health advisory standard is 70 parts per trillion. Harvard is suggesting one part per trillion. I think we need water that we can drink. And, and you know, like every civilized country does, you need water you can drink from every water. I have a property now that's sitting next to a toxic waste dump, but my entire life savings is probably down the drain. I've got neighbors and myself that were wondering what their health I don't know how they give me back my husband. I don't know that 
they can. But I don't know. I don't know how they make it right. But ignoring it isn't making it right. You lose your husband, and it's the worst thing on earth. But you slowly get back. You slowly kind of come back to life. And now, I remember in June this year thinking, I feel like I'm getting my joy back. And then in July, I get these government people walking up my driveway saying, we think you've got poison groundwater. And it's just brought it all back. It's just my joy right back. I've never had contact with Wolverine. Never. I've never heard a word. Not sorry. Not my apologies. Not a few. Nothing. I've heard nothing from Wolverine. It's just been Rosen West. Yeah. I think I got the most sympathy and empathy from um, Karen at the BBQ. Probably the most So, that poor lady, right? Her house, basically worthless now. I mean, do you want to buy a house that the water is toxic in, right? We've got another friend who lives right up there on House Street, not too far away. Um, and she's had several miscarriages. Um, and... Uh, her house there, they they say that you can pull this out uh, with a, um, a reverse osmosis filter. Uh, so you put that on and, you know, before you pull it out and it's, it's fine. But they've had three different filters put on now and none of them have reduced it below the safe drinking level. Right? So this is uh, some areas I said, you know, whoops, I said, uh, you know, lots of areas around Michigan here that... Uh, um, you know, we have and or around the Great Lakes that we've been working really hard to clean up, right? Um, and one of these are our Great Lakes areas of concern. Um, and this is by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which Trump has attempted to kill several times. Um, but uh, so here, uh, um, the, the hollow green ones, which is only one of, right, that was delisted before Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. These green ones are ones that we have taken care of in the uh, with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. The triangles are ones that we're planned on working on, and then the black ones are ones that still need uh, still need work, right? So there's lots of areas, even though we've cleaned up the Great Lakes, there's lots of areas that we still have lots of issues. Kalamazoo River being a big one, we had the world's largest inland oil spill on the Kalamazoo River um, a number of years back, right? And then if you future potential water issues. I played this for you before, but I'm just going to play it again. This is the video by a student that they did for their um, Great Lakes or um, for their uh, um, environmental geology project, right? Enbridge Energy Partners is a Canadian company that specializes in energy transportation and distribution. In July of 2010, Enbridge was responsible for the largest inland oil spill in United States history. As you can see from some video I think we have from Chopper 7 and from the ground, a huge slick, about 877,000 gallons of oil have spilled out into the creek here near the Kalamazoo River. More than a million gallons of tar sands made its way into the Kalamazoo River system. They've just declared a state of emergency here in Calhoun County. I'm told that there's very toxic chemicals in this oil. Cleanup cost was estimated at $1.2 billion. Ecologically speaking, the river system still has not recovered from this disaster. Five years after the worst inland oil spill in the country, there's another pipeline running through our state, and some say it's another disaster waiting to happen. Two miles west of the Mackinac Bridge resides another of Enbridge's oil transportation systems. Twin pipelines move 23 million gallons of oil a day. As if that fact alone is not frightening enough, the pipeline was built in 1953, making it nearly 65 years old. A potential spill would contaminate 15% of Lake Michigan's open water and 60% of Lake Huron's. It would threaten the drinking water supply of 400,000 customers, dismantle a $30 billion tourism industry, and annual four to seven billion dollar fishery. This freshwater network is an ecological sanctuary to a unique collection of 3,500 plant and animal species and 18% of the world's surface freshwater. Enbridge's data reveals cracks, dents, and corrosion. An onshore portion has lost nearly 26% of its wall thickness. Patches of bare metal larger than dinner plates are visible in photos of protective coating gaps. 
much larger than the Band-Aid sized areas in Enbridge's original reports. Line 5 has already spilled at least 1.13 million gallons in the past 50 years in 30 other areas besides the Strait. The most well known was in 1999, where 222,600 gallons of oil spilled into Crystal Falls, Michigan. What stops an event like this from occurring in the Straits? The currents under the Straits are three times as powerful as Niagara Falls, flowing in multiple directions, causing the steel pipeline to undulate. Sediments once supporting the pipeline have washed away. Although the company claims to have an emergency spill response plan, it was not approved by the federal government. There is no protocol for a catastrophic freshwater oil spill. And there is no acceptable way to clean up oil from underneath the thick fractured ice that layers the streets for a fifth of the year. One of Enbridge's arguments to keep Line 5 operational is that its employees may lose their jobs. 250 in all statewide, whereas one in every five Michigan jobs relies on a healthy Great Lakes ecosystem. That's 700,000. Enbridge claims that it is an essential supplier of energy to Michigan. In reality, only 5 to 10 percent of Lion 5's product stays in Michigan. Many environmental lawyers believe that Enbridge is illegally operating this pipeline. Water is a public trust owned by the residents of Michigan, not by the government or any one corporation. The current administration is not addressing this issue. It is up to the citizens of Michigan to help change that. Right. Amazing video. Um, anyway, so Line 5 is still operating. There are, um, it's going to be shut down. And uh, as I understood, they're going to drill underneath the straits. Uh, they'll dig a tunnel underneath in the rock, in the bedrock. Uh, and that should help to uh, prevent any. Uh, oil spills um, into the Great Lakes. But, uh, you know, it still is, as of this moment, a concern, right? Uh, as I as I mentioned, you know, one one time, we thought, you know, we'll just pump it all in the lakes and they'll just take it, right? But dilution is not the solution, right? Um, so we can't just pump it into the lakes. We've known that now, right? Uh, although there, there are still plenty of areas where we are pumping them into the lakes, right? Uh, we have done a lot to, you know, as far as legislation to try to increase water quality, right? Uh, we started the International Joint Commission uh, on Water Quality, and that uh, means that we share with Canada and the other states around. Um, we all had to uh, to agree uh, if somebody was going to do something to the water, everybody has to agree to it, right? No water quality agreement in 1972, and then new management approaches, the remediation action plans, Lake-wide management plans, so these are for little local areas, these are for whole lake areas, right? And then the identification of those areas of concern that I showed you for the um, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, right? So 